Hey there once again YouTube, my name is Ben Ferriolo and I am dedicated to the responsible and accurate seismic monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. First off, if you have not already, please bookmark my website. A link is provided under my email address in the description box below. It contains a great deal of information, including how to understand the many types of seismic plots and charts that people use, how to find, access, and analyze seismic data, and it also contains hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images regarding a great many seismic events and earthquake swarms on many different pages. Trust me, you would be surprised as to what you find. Now, although there has been some swarming at Clear Lake Volcano in California, which I'm still looking through, which is actually the location of the largest geothermal pumping operation in the world called the Geysers, activity has been somewhat calm here in the United States. There was, of course, some swarming in Colorado some odd days ago near Mount Lindsay and Blanca Peak, down near the New Mexico-Colorado border, and Yellowstone has been really quiet. Well, except for today. Just a few hours ago from the time I'm recording this, and the time I'm recording this is 11, 11 a.m., March 4th, 2019, a reported magnitude 3.3 and 1.6 have struck the eastern portion of Yellowstone Caldera, just outside the Caldera boundary. But that is not the weirdest thing. Also, only 45 seconds after the magnitude 1.6 was reported for Yellowstone, a magnitude 4.6, originally reported to be a 5.3, and now downgraded to a 4.5, struck western Colorado in a strange location as well. Now, how is this possible if there is no type of connection? It has been virtually quiet for both areas for a while. Then, all of a sudden, there's a large spike of seismicity within the same exact hour, both at Yellowstone and near southwestern Colorado. How is that possible? To me, that shows that there has to be some type of connection. But I really have no clue what connection that would be. Also, Steamboat Geyser in the Norris Geyser Basin is set to erupt today, if it holds to its near-weekly schedule. Now, it hasn't erupted yet, but remember to keep an eye on my Steamboat 2019 page under the Seismic Events drop-down menu on my website. I'm usually very quick uploading the plots when there is a new eruption. So, let's first just check out the magnitude 3.3 and 1.6 that was just reported for the eastern section of Yellowstone Caldera. Here we have the United States as of the past 24 hours. Let's first zoom into Yellowstone. Let's do Yellowstone first, guys. Only two being reported. So here's the reported magnitude 3.3. Now with the terrain option on, we can see that this occurred near Little Saddle Mountain. Notice that Little Saddle Mountain and Haig Mountain. If I said that correct, let me know. And then look up here. We have Amethyst Mountain. The Caldera Boundary is right here. Yellowstone Lake is right here. So called there a boundary, Amethyst Mountain. Very interesting to know it's not too far from Amethyst Mountain. Of course, the epicenters are different, but this increase in seismicity was very close to the location of the January 6, 2019 rapid fire swarm that struck just south of Amethyst Mountain, northeast of Yellowstone Lake, just outside the Caldera boundary. For this swarm shown on this page, the quantity was not great. However, they occurred in a very close time period with some much larger magnitudes than what we usually see. So if you'd like to see the information and seismic plots pertaining to the January 6, 2019 earthquake swarm near Amethyst Mountain, which actually did not occur that far away from today's seismicity, then please scroll down to the description box and click the link that I provided. Or you can just come to my website here, go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu, click Yellowstone Supervolcano, and scroll through the uh, many swarms that I have listed on there, and you'll find it. It's called January 6, 2019 Swarm North Northeast of Yellowstone Lake. So here we are back at earthquake.usgs.gov. You can tell, again, the Caldera Boundary is right about here. Yellowstone Lake is here. Amethyst Mountain is right here, and the location of the January 6, 2019 rapid fire swarm with larger magnitudes than what we should expect, it was right about here, in this location, right about here. So, we do have these two reported earthquakes, there could be a few more, but let's first take a look at the magnitude 3.3. It was reportedly at 6.0 kilometers in depth and struck at 1716 UTC. Please remember the time, that'll play into what I'm talking about in this video. Again, 1716 UTC, of course, on March 4th, 3.3, 6.0. And then we had an aftershock only about six minutes or so later. And this was a magnitude 1.6 at 7.8 kilometers in depth. As we zoom out, I just want to show you something in relation 
to the magnitude 4.5, which used to be a magnitude 4.6, and also used to be a magnitude 5.3. They downgraded it twice. Um, I do agree with the downgrade, though. At one of them. I agree with the downgrade from magnitude 5.3 for the Colorado earthquake. Because originally they stated it was a 5.3, right? I uh, I don't think it was a 5.3. I don't think they should have gone below a 4.7 or 4.8, though. It's definitely not a 4.5 because, in my opinion, it's much stronger than that. Because look how far away it was, and it showed up quite strong on the seismic stations at Yellowstone, guys. So, And it traveled quite far and was pretty shallow, so I'm thinking that, oh, this is more along the lines of a 4.8, 4.9. But we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. But look at what the most recent earthquakes are as of 24 hours for this location here. Notice we have the 3.3 at Yellowstone that I just looked at at 1716. Then we have the 1.6 at 1722, right? We'll look at what also happened during 1722. The 4.5 struck. And then we have at 1741 an aftershock in Colorado. So again, they both went off at the same time. The magnitude 3.3 struck only about six minutes prior to the magnitude 4.5 in Colorado. Now, if both locations were quiet for the longest time, and then all of a sudden we see a huge increase in seismicity in both the locations, doesn't that make you think that they could be connected in some way? But then again, look how far away they are, guys. What is it? That's got to be like, what, 600, 700 miles? I don't know the exact number, but I'm just saying it's got to be. Because if you see the 100-mile mark down here, it's not that long. Right here, look at this. From right here to right here is 100 miles. So I thought that was very interesting. Definitely far away and showed up quite well on the seismic stations of Yellowstone. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. I always get ahead of myself. Again, here's the magnitude 3.3, which struck at 6.0 kilometers in depth. And then a 1.6 at 7.8 kilometers in depth. Let's go to the event page. Notice when you click the tab uh, beforehand on the map, it said that there was a Did You Feel a report. But then you go on here and there's no Did You Feel a report. Isn't that weird here? Let's go back. Look at this. See? Obviously it's white, but white means that whoever felt it just barely felt it at all. But still, it says there's a report, right? You go here and looky looky. There is no felt report at all for the magnitude 3.3 at 6.0 kilometers in depth. So I thought that was very strange. Let's go to origin, shall we? Go to phases. Okay, go to arrival time. And the closest station was YMP. Now, let's see if that station will work. That station does not detect events as well as I would like it to. So we might have to use YPC possibly. But first, let's just take a look at the closest seismic station, YMP. Here we are at the data download site. So it's WYYMP01EHZ. Let's have the time period set. Let's do four, zero, 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 zero. Let's do five. Okay, that'll work. So let's download the data. Will it work? Yes, it worked. Let's go to swarm. Here we are in the seismic program swarm. Let me just do this real fast. Persistent rescale off, 95 overlap. And look, here's on YMP, right? So they said that it showed first on YMP. Well, I'm really not liking this much, guys. See, look, we have YMP right here. Look at that. Okay, so I'm really not liking this very much because it does not look like it. I mean, obviously the arrival time probably came here first out of all the stations. But it barely even detected it. And then obviously there was a 1.6 aftershock, but it's not even shown. It's not even shown. So sadly, we are going to have to try to go and download some seismic data from a different station just to get a better look at this event. See, the difference in arrival times from YMP for the S wave, because look up here, the arrival time for YMP is 3.2 seconds. But for borehole 208, which is one of the stations I'm about to use, it's 6.8 seconds. It's about double. And YEE actually saw it before borehole 208 actually and yee -E is this strange station right over here but look what we see on yee -E. now i think i am going to use yee -E because it is a little bit more sensitive because it is a broadband station and you can actually see the aftershocks here looky looky okay so let's use station yee -E. remember only in regards to the wy network at yellowstone for shz that's wrong there's no such thing as an SHZ channel for the WY network at all, period. Unless in the future they make one. But right now, that means they added a 1 hertz high pass filter 
to a broadband station to make it look like a short period station. So let's download this seismic data for station YEE and let's open it in Swarm. Okay, here we have seismic station YEE for the same time period that I just downloaded. Now let's go to the spectrogram just real quick. There it is right there. So YEE, although it was farther away than uh, many of the stations in the area, YMP and YPC, uh, some of the stations that have those weird waveform oscillations. If, if you monitor Yellowstone and you see those weird oscillations on the Webby quarters, you know what I'm talking about then. So those stations there that see those weird oscillations, those do not detect events very well at all. I don't know why. I, it could be because the background noise is just far too strong for whatever reason. I do not know why. But still, I think it's very interesting how those stations did not detect it as well as the more distant stations. I don't know, maybe there was some rock blocking some of the signals. But then again, seismic waves can travel through pretty much anything, no matter what. So again, we see it right here. The station was probably the fifth or sixth closest station, but we could still get a good look at it. Notice the P and S waves are pretty much separated, just like they should for an earthquake at that depth. Let's go to the spectrogram. Teeny tiny aftershocks. Notice the teeny teeny tiny aftershocks. And notice right here, we did have some dominant lower frequencies at the tail end on the surface waves of this event. Right here, this is the magnitude 1.6 aftershock that came after the magnitude 3.3 struck Yellowstone in a very odd location. Now this right here, you see this? Remember about 40 seconds or so after the 1.6, the magnitude 4.5 struck Colorado, right? Well, you got to remember it does take a good amount of time to travel towards Yellowstone, but the arrival times are looking pretty consistent. Notice right here, we do have again the magnitude 1.6 aftershock of Yellowstone. And then skip ahead. Only about a minute later, we see the regional earthquake come in from the 4.5 in Colorado, which I personally believe to be more like along the lines of a 4.8. Now let's go here. Let's go to the spectrogram real quick. So we already know this right here is the 4.5 in Colorado. If you're using the program Swarm or another type of seismic anal analysis program, just simply download some data from the stations there at Yellowstone. Then download some data from the stations in Southwest Wyoming, like G-A-W-Y in the UU network or something like that. And then download some stations from Southern Colorado and Northern Colorado. And look at how the waveforms propagate away from the source. So let's move forward. So for Yellowstone, we do have another aftershock right here. Again, with some lower frequencies, lower than what I would expect right here. But that could just be very strong surface waves because it's kind of deep. I don't know, though. But again, we do have some more aftershocks throughout the day. Little teeny tiny popping. Teeny tiny popping. Still some more aftershocks. However, I don't know what this is. What is this? Hello there. I do not know what this is. That's very interesting. Only going to 100 amplitude count, so it's nothing too notable right now, but let's go forward. I'm not seeing any, uh-oh, what's this? That looks like a teleseism. Personally, at 1901, let's go to the earthquake map. At 1901, let's zoom to the world. At 1901, nothing, nothing. There was a 4.8 in Indonesia at 1813, but that's it. Nothing else that could cause that low frequency wave unless there is an unreported earthquake, which wouldn't surprise me at all. So that, that was very strange, this little frequency event right here. But it does look exactly, guys, exactly like a teleseism to me. That's just to me. And again, let's go back to the magnitude 3.3 at Yellowstone. Check out the dominant frequencies just real fast. Notice they stay below 5 hertz, but of course weaker frequency is going well beyond 5 hertz. Let's log frequency. Notice the frequency starting at about 0.4 hertz right where the filter starts. So we do have some dominant lower frequencies going probably all the way back to the micro level. So that's very interesting. And then the uh, frequencies of the regional earthquake are much lower, of course, like they should be from a very distant earthquake. So that's it for right now for Yellowstone. Again... We'll keep an eye on it. Steamboat is set to erupt soon. Uh, I do believe another swarm could be approaching. That's just my belief. That's just what I think. Another swarm could be approaching for Yellowstone. It's just been a little too quiet lately 
for my for my comfort. We should be seeing more activity than we are right now. So let's move on to the Colorado earthquake, which was actually so strong that it shook up Yellowstone Caldera. I mean, look at MCID. Look at this. Look at that. That's the 4.5, which I believe to be a 4.8 in Colorado. Notice how it shook up the caldera like crazy. Even the stations that do not record greatly, like YPC, doesn't record events too great, still picked it up right there. So I thought that was very interesting. So let's go to earthquake.usgs.gov and zoom in on the Colorado earthquake. So here we are at earthquake.usgs.gov, zoomed in in Colorado. Look, this is where the magnitude 4.5, which I believe to be a 4.8, struck. Right down here. Now, I looked for any su old, old, old super volcanoes or volcanoes in this area. I did not find any, but I heard that there are some volcanic fields in this area near Paradox and Bedrock, Colorado. But please correct me if I'm wrong about that. Again, here is the location of the earthquake. This is Colorado right here. This is the southwestern tip of Colorado down here. And this is the location where you can stand in four states at once. Remember Colorado, Utah, uh, Arizona, and New Mexico are these states that you can stand in four states at once. And let's go down here. So let me know, do you guys know of any volcanic activity in this area in western Colorado, right near the border of Utah? So let me know if you've ever heard of any volcanic activity occurring out here. So there was an aftershock reported at 1.9 at 1.3 kilometers in depth. Let's look at that first. Oh, looks like they're reporting as a 2.0 now. Oh, so 2.0 at 1.3 kilometers in depth, which actually 65 people reported feeling the 2.0. Wow, that's pretty strong. And that occurred at 1741 UTC, so about 20 minutes or so after the original main shock. Let's go to the magnitude 4.5 which I believe to be a 4.8, struck at 0 0.8 kilometers in depth. Now they do have a focal mechanism solution, and it does look like a normal tectonic event, but we will still have to go look at it on the seismic data, of course, because I always like to look at that stuff. Again, 4.5, likely to be a 4.8, I believe. S almost 700 people reported feeling it to USGS. Those are only the people that reported feeling this to USGS. If this number is this high, I'm betting it it's actually in the thousands, guys. I bet everybody who lives near this area within 100 miles or so felt it. I bet you anything, guys. So we do have the moment tensor right there. And they have an aftershock forecast. They do expect more aftershocks to happen. They say it it is possible for a larger earthquake around magnitude 6 to magnitude 7 to strike in this area, but the probabilities are extremely low. It's highly unlikely. But still, you never know, guys. You never know with how weird earthquake activity has been lately. Then they have the magnitude, 4.49. There's no depth, or excuse me, there's no magnitude discrepancy. Apparently, they think it is exactly 4.49 magnitude, and no, no more and no less. The location uncertainty, that looks pretty good. And the depth uncertainty, uh, that's almost 1.0 kilometers. So it could go all the way up to about 1.8 kilometers in depth or even shallower than that. So the depth was not constrained as well as it could have been. But apparently they say the magnitude was constrained quite well. I don't know. Maybe they are right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am wrong. But still. So here we are in origin at phases. I have arrival time set. This is the closest seismic station to the earthquake swarm. PV11 in the RE network. Notice how, remember Bedrock, Calif or, excuse me, Bedrock, Colorado is right here. Here's where the seismic station is located. So that means the seismic station is located right in this location right here. So it was pretty much right at the epicenter, guys. So we're going to get a very good look at what this swarm looked like and how many aftershocks are actually taking place of this swarm. Maybe it's not a swarm, maybe it's just a main shock tectonic event with many aftershocks, but we'll have to wait and see and look at the seismic data. So first we got to go here, RE PV11. I believe it was dash dash, right? Let's see, was it dash dash? Did I get it right? Nope. Let's go to... Never mind, I'm trying to understand... Look, RE PV11, right? RE P V 11 dash dash when there is no location code and we can see there's no location code given but that does give us a channel code of HHZ HHZ the date is correct the date is correct 
mini seed, everything's correct. We should see it. And we don't. Okay, so let's try the second closest seismic station, which is this. Everything's the same except it's PV05. Let's go PV05, please work. And it doesn't work. Okay, so everything in the RE network is not working, even though that was the closest seismic station. Look what station we have to use since these weren't working. Look at what station we have to use. We have to use US MVCO. All of that. Look at that. We have to use one that is 21.1 second arrival time away. That's that's a good distance, guys. I do not like using seismic stations for close swarm analysis that are that far away. I do not like to do that. But we pretty much have no choice in this matter, guys. Let's try it one more time. PV15 in the RE. PV15 dash dash HHZ. The date is correct. And there's nothing. Okay, so if that's not true and that's not it, then how did they get the arrival times off these stations if the date is not there? That obviously means the date is there, but why can't I access it? Everything's correct. All the parameters are exactly correct and exactly the way they should be. So that's frustrating me a little bit, but still we'll go with what we can get. MVCO in the US network. So let's do US MVCO 00 BHZ. Let's try this. There we go. That worked. Let's check it out in the program swarm. You know, it sucks that this is the closest station we have to go on. Even though USGS obviously says they picked the arrival times from those stations in the RE network, but we can't access it. Why can't I? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just getting a little frustrated right now. Actually, never mind. I'm getting really frustrated because I just don't know why. Why, why is it not available? That doesn't make sense. It says Iris DMC on the data center as well. So we should be able to get the data, but we didn't at all. So let's just go through this. I don't know what that is. Maybe an explosion. <laughs> I don't know. But let's go forward. This is before the earthquake. Far before the earthquake. This is probably about, I'm going to say, 12 to 14 hours before the earthquake occurred. Before the 4.5, which I believe to be a 4.8. At 0 0.8 kilometers in depth. Remember, 0, 0.0 sea level, so you have to count the local sea level in there too. Uh, let's go down. Okay, you can see the earthquake down here as well, but let's just keep going forward. There's really nothing. There's no low frequency background tremor. There's a little bit of low frequency microseisms, but that is to be expected on a broadband station. Going forward, still not seeing much. A little microquake there. I just saw that one. Yes, I did. Surface noise, something else. Uh, keep going. There was an event right there. Don't know what that was. It looks like a regional earthquake. A deep one and keep going forward keep going forward keep going forward and here we are okay so here is the magnitude 4.5 which in my head i believe to be a magnitude 4.8 again the station was pretty far away guys pretty far away from the earthquake and we but this is the closest station we were able to find data for so oh well and then they said there was an aftershock later on, but I am unsure if the aftershock will even show on this station at all. Let's go to the spectrogram, and it did. There is the aftershock right there. So the aftershock, which was a 1.6, I believe. Uh, no, no, never mind. It was a 2.0. Remember, it was a 1.9 to 2.0. That is this one right here. So let's move forward. Let's go, let's go to the spectrogram. As of the most recent data stream, I am not seeing much else. A few more little teeny tiny microquake aftershocks. But I am surprised that the aftershocks are not bigger. I'm surprised that the, a lot there aren't a lot of 2.0s, right? 2.0s, 3.0s. I'm surprised that they're all remaining around 1.5 to 2.0 or so. So the quantity and the magnitudes of the aftershocks is not as great as what I would expect. What is this? Do not know what this is, but it does have some dominant lower frequencies a little bit. Of course, it does have some weaker frequencies going up to about, what is that, about 15, 16 hertz or so. But still, that's very interesting right there. Don't know what that was. Let's move forward, see if there's anything else. Not seeing much. Oh, we did have a aftershock right there and an aftershock right there and right there too. So we did have probably, I'm going to say, no more than 10 aftershocks. 
And that's pretty much it for the most recent data stream as of about 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time, March 4th, 2019. Ooh, perfect timing, right in the middle of an eruption of Old Faithful, woohoo! So that is it for right now, guys. Remember, Steamboat Geyser in the Norse Geyser Basin is set to erupt again today, if it holds to its near-weekly schedule. Remember, keep an eye on my Steamboat Geyser 2019 page on my website for the plots of the eruption whenever it decides to happen. Also, we looked at some very interesting events spaced hundreds of miles apart, but occurred within the same hour of each other. What could this mean? I don't know, but it sure is odd. Both areas saw a large spike in seismicity at nearly the same exact time. I will continue to update you guys if there are any changes. Also, it is March 4th, so that means my next video will be the monthly volcano update. I'm still working on the GPS deformation video, guys. It is taking a long time. Not because the video itself is long, but because I was having a very hard time understanding the different aspects of the data. Now I believe I have understood at least most of what is required to make your own GPS charts and make your own interpretations of recent data. Thank you much to Michael Poland of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory for being actually quite kind in providing the basic information and tools required for short-term ground deformation monitoring not just at Yellowstone, but many other locations of the United States as well. I hope you all had a great day and God bless. Remember, the truth is considered hate or fear to those that hate or fear that specific truth. Ben Ferriolo signing off and stay tuned for more.